all of us in this big room of fossil fuel repression, oppression, and um, government complicity. And we're the mosquito that's like constantly after the big um, demons and biting them. Uh, but some background on the Power Coalition. We have been fighting the Mountain Valley Pipeline for the past 10 years. Uh, the MVP is a 303 mile frack gas pipeline that's a large diameter pipeline. So it's 42 inches um, and it travels across the extremely steep slopes of Appalachia through all of West Virginia and Southwest Virginia and then into North Carolina with the um, Southgate extension. And about six months ago, there was a big shift in the pipeline struggle when West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin forced Congress and the president to fast track the pipeline. And so we've really turned to focus our, our struggle and strategy on defunding the pipeline because the legislation he passed uh, restricted a lot of the judicial and legislative means of fighting the pipeline. So we're really excited to be here and learn with you all about the asset managers behind the Mountain Valley Pipeline and how we can target them as well as how they're different from the banks that we're targeting because we see the Mountain Valley Pipeline is a huge risk to investors, and we really want to uplift that message um, as people on the front line are combating uh, really horrific construction. Um, and the Mountain Valley Pipeline crosses the lands of the Yesaw people, who were also um, subject to genocide by what now is the United States and displaced over many years. Um, and one of our critical partners is Seven Directions of Service who work on the Southgate extension and do really incredible work. So make sure to check them out as well. And I'm excited to learn with you all uh, and answer any questions about the pipeline in the chat. Thanks, Yamara. Thank you, Denali. I am super excited for us to be building this together. Um, in this webinar, we're going to be covering how Vanguard, the world's number one investor in fossil fuels, is linked to the Mountain Valley Pipeline. What is an asset manager? What is Vanguard? What are bonds? The difference between banks and asset managers for campaigning purposes how Vanguard is linked to the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and what are the next steps in this campaign? And also, what does this have to do with you? We have with us a couple of wonderful people who will be sharing on these topics today, including myself, wonderful, my colleague, Jimena, who is also wonderful, who will be sharing about bonds and why they're a critical angle in the climate finance space. And last but not least, the wonderful and amazing Lena from Earthquaker Action Team, or Equate, who have been an integral part of our Vanguard SOS coalition. And she'll be sharing some of the incredible work that Equate has done on Vanguard. At the end of all of the presentations, we're going to have a Q&A period and um, I would love to ask you to hold on to your questions until the very end, unless they're critical to understanding the rest of the presentation. Now, I know that finance kind of makes all of our eyes glaze over a little bit. So we're going to try and give you the basic, most important details. And I know that even that can get a little bit confusing. So please write down all your questions. And if we don't get to them, we're gonna provide you with contact information to get answers. Because I don't want one little detail to be the reason that anybody gives up on trying to understand this facet of our climate resistance that's really critical. So please don't feel embarrassed to ask or say that you didn't understand anything. Let's get into it. So this graphic is a very basic visual of Vanguard's ties to the Mountain Valley Pipeline companies. I'm hoping, hoping that by the end of this webinar, it will make more sense to folks if it seems confusing right now. I also want to mention that in early 2022, NextEra, the biggest backer of Mountain Valley Pipeline's 
wrote off its investment in the pipeline due to a very low probability of pipeline completion. Asset management is investing money into portfolios of stocks, bond purchases, which Jimena will explain later on, and other financial mechanisms with the intention of those investments receiving a profit return, also known as making money for their client. Asset managers such as Vanguard or BlackRock, the two largest asset managers in the world, are trusted by their clients to put their money somewhere that will make them a profit. Imagine putting your retirement into the hands of a company. You want to trust them to do their very best. A lot of people also trust them to use their money wisely, and they expect investment options that are environmentally friendly, sustainable, and align with their values, not to mention account for minimal financial risk. So in this image, you can see that from left to right, an example of where money comes from that's going to asset managers is pensions, 401ks, or endowments of large organizations or universities. This isn't the only place that money is coming from, but for the purpose of this graphic, it shows the relationship from where the money starts and how it gets invested into corporations. Asset managers primarily invest client assets through index funds. Index funds invest in and track the market for example, the S&P 500 is not just an individual company. The S&P 500 is an index fund tracking the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States. The asset manager on behalf of the investor, their client, is spreading bets across the whole market. Most of the index funds are passively managed, but there are two types of index funds, passively managed and actively managed. When describing passive index funds, think autopilot for index funds. For those of you who have a strong visual imagination, visualize with me. Five check boxes. You can check any of those boxes, which each represent an index fund made up of any number of companies, and your investment will be spread across all of the companies in that particular fund. When we say passively managed index funds, we refer to the most common method used by people who don't realize that they have other options or who are seeking less expensive and less risky investing. This is why it's important to pressure asset managers to provide passive index fund options that are sustainable and that don't fund violent practices or destructive practices. Imagine if one of those check boxes was labeled violates human rights. It would be humorous if we didn't know that there will always be people who will choose to continue those destructive investments. AMs want to claim, AMs, asset managers, want to claim that they can't provide index funds that filter like this, but they can. An actively managed index fund is just that, actively managed by a person, an asset manager. They hand pick each company using guidelines provided by their client about what kind of investments they wanna make. It's often more expensive because a human being is being paid to do a job rather than a machine. And there are more transaction fees, which can be a deterrent for folks who are trying to make as much profit as possible, no matter what. There's also an added risk to this called stranded assets. Stranded assets are assets or money that loses its value or turns into a liability before the end of their expected economic life. For example, a drop in demand of a product like fossil fuels or government regulation of a product. So if you've invested money into a company that's building a pipeline and there, there's no need for that product anymore, what happens to your invested money? Vanguard prides itself on telling the public, you're more than just an investor, you're an owner. They privately, they're privately owned, so, that th so they say that their clients that invest in their funds are the true owners of Vanguard. An owner or a client is also referred to as a shareholder. Shareholder resolutions are proposals to the company to make a change of some kind, and it's voted on by all the owners, clients, shareholders at annual general meetings. 
If you've heard of AGM season, it's usually in the springtime when lots of financial institutions are holding their annual general meetings. Unfortunately, these companies like Vanguard have a track record of using their clients' investments or money to fund destructive behavior such as fossil fuel extraction, arms and weapons supplies, egregious human rights and indigenous rights violations, and community contamination, just to name a few. Vanguard is the number one investor globally in the fossil fuel industry and has over $300 billion of its 50 million clients' money invested in these owner companies of harmful projects. Last year, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was about to read my own box. Customers from all over the world have started demanding sustainable investing options from their asset managers. So the fact that Vanguard last year only supported 2% of their clients' shareholder resolutions is incredible and disturbing for a company that's entire pitch is how their clients make decisions and our owners. It makes us wonder, are their clients really owners? Okay, so this is a similar chart from what you saw a couple of slides ago, but it's showing all of the financial pillars that are propping up the fossil fuel industry. You see, as before, that we start with our base funding, which comes from client money. Private equity, central banks, and international banks, as well as private banks and bonds, are the three other major pillars but for today, we're going to be focusing on asset managers with a side of bonds and how there is a relationship between asset managers and banks. And I know that that already sounds a little bit overwhelming, and it is a little overwhelming, but we're going to get through it. So as I mentioned before, the money or assets that Vanguard is investing comes primarily from the form of high wealth individuals which is the loveliest way of saying rich people, institutional investors like employer pension plans and employer-sponsored retirement funds called a 401k. A pension plan is a retirement plan that requires an employer to make contributions to a pool of funds set aside for an employee to use in the future. That pool of money is invested on behalf of the employee and the money made from those investments generates income for the employee to use upon retirement. Pensions are usually paid out in guaranteed regular payments until the employee dies. Um, I Before I keep going, I also want to just remind folks to um, type their question in the Q&A box at the bottom. You can see there's a chat in the Q&A box. Uh, you're welcome to put your questions in there if you're like, I'm not going to remember this. Let me type it right now. So 401k is an employer-sponsored retirement account that allows an employee, like myself, to divert a percent of my salary, either before or after the taxes are taken out, to go into an account, a 401k account. I can then pick which investment options that are offered by the plan of my employee or my employer um, that I want to allocate those funds to. Unfortunately, most people just select the automatic investment options which yield the most profit, but are investing money in fossil fuel extraction, again, arms and weapons supplies, and committing human rights and indigenous rights violations. There's a lot of opportunity to pressure companies, for example, Google, which is Vanguard's largest client, to demand on behalf of their employees sustainable and ethical investment choices. Now, how do AMs, asset managers, and banks connect? The role of banks is different than the role of asset managers. Both are providing money to companies that are driving climate change. How they provide that money and who the money belongs to is what is different. Both institutions pump trillions of dollars every year into destructive fossil fuel companies like Equitrans. As an example, you might know that Equitrans is one of the owners of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So they continue to ramp up projects that are devastating local communities, exacerbating climate change and violating human rights. These institutions use different mechanisms to provide financial capital, money. Asset managers provide 
uh, fund the continued expansion of fossil fuels by providing corporate financing to Equitrans through their index fund products. This way of investing makes asset managers like Vanguard a top shareholder of any given company in the market. Banks, on the other hand, tend to act as underwriters, which mean they use lending mechanisms or loans to corporations and often to specific projects that corporations are building, like the Mountain Valley Pipeline, for example. Now, here's where it gets even more interesting. Because of the index fund model, remember the checkboxes that we talked about before, asset managers are not only the top shareholder of a fossil fuel company, they're also the top shareholders in banks. Those same institutions who are driving the expansion of specific projects like the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So if you if you know about Mountain Valley Pipeline resistance work, you'll know that there's campaigns already existing on the banks that are funding Mountain Valley Pipeline. So this graphic is is now a graphic of our imagination of the boxes, the check boxes. So here's an index fund. Within this index fund, there are four companies. So those four companies, Google, Equitrans, Chevron, Bank of America. Um, Vanguard is the second largest shareholder, owner, remember, within Bank of America. They have a 7% stake valued at over $13 billion. And Wells Fargo, they are the largest shareholder with an 8.48% stake valued at over $15 billion. So as a shareholder, asset managers can also use their voting power to demand banks phase out the continued financing of fossil fuels. Shareholders can literally vote to fire the board of directors if a company is not acting on climate. Vanguard has the power to stop Bank of America and Wells Fargo from continued funding of the Mountain Valley Pipeline and the Southgate Extension Project if it chose to take up the fight under pressure from its shareholders. Not only asset managers must be pressured to halt their own financing of fossil fuels, but they also need to be pressured to use their voting powers to demand financial institutions like banks phase out fossil fuels and fossil fuel companies and enable credible trans transition plans. So oop, a little bit early, we're gonna go right back. <laughs> so campaigning and exercising uh, pressure on both asset managers and banks are a relationship that's really, really critical to stop the fossil fuel economy from growing. And as you can see, they're connected. So this is how I feel while I'm explaining this. <laughs> and I hope that we're all feeling like this right now because um, it leads to this and it's only gonna get more amazing. I want us all to take a deep breath and wipe the sweat of financial excitement off of our foreheads. And at this point, I'm gonna transition to a video from our colleague, Jimena, who's part of our Sunrise Bonds team and couldn't join us because it's the middle of the night in London uh, where she's based. So I'm going to... Pull up this video. Give me one second. So hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me today. My name is Jimena Purita Banea Salio, and I am originally from Bolivia, and I'm a campaigner with the Bonds team at the Sunrise Project. So I'm probably sure you're wondering what are bonds and how are they even relevant to this topic in the first place? So let me ask you this. How does the fossil fuel industry find trillions of dollars during a climate crisis? Well, this is where I come in to tell you about the massive money pipeline that they have been using to secure funding. And this is the bonds market. So today I will give you a brief introduction to the bond market, provide you with a solid grasp of the basics of how bonds work and the key players involved. And I will also explain why bonds are important for fossil fuel companies and show why campaigners need to turn their attention to the bond market to cut off finance for coal, oil and gas expansion. Any questions, please, can be shared on the chat, and some extra documents will be shared with you at the end of this session. 
So let's begin. And I will now share my screen with all of you. So the bond market is a very unfamiliar territory for many campaigners, especially compared to targeting other aspects of the financial system. But just because bonds are unfamiliar, it doesn't mean campaigners can't engage with them. In fact, bonds are such a crucial pillar of financing for companies that we would argue campaigners must understand them and also must want to engage with them because they're also a very clever and very strategic way to directly target fossil fuel companies that are issuing bonds to raise money for their expansion. Well, the accounting behind bonds can be a little bit more complex, understanding the basic concept of a bond and knowing why bonds are important for fossil fuel companies is quite straightforward. So when a company wants to raise money, they have two main routes of doing so, equity financing or debt financing. Equity financing requires that the company to give up a percentage of ownership through selling shares. Debt financing, on the other hand, require borrowing and eventually paying back the money over an agreed period of time, plus the interest. So companies that pursue this area, the debt financing area, have two main ways of doing so. One is a direct loan from a bank or a financial institution, and the second one is through issuing bonds. Companies can often borrow much more money using bonds with lower interest rates compared to bank loans. And bonds have often have fewer restriction compared to bank loans and don't involve handing over any control of the company to investors as it is the case when you sell some shares. Therefore, by issuing bonds, companies can enjoy less public scrutiny, less transparency, and ready access to debt. So what exactly is a bond then? While a loan is a direct relationship with agreed terms between a bank and the borrower, companies issuing bonds sell them on a market to any interested investors. With a bond, multiple investors lend money to a company for a set period of time, and this is called the maturity date. On average, this can be 10 years. In exchange, the investors get regular interest payments at a fixed rate, and this is also known as a coupon. And this is usually paid annually or semi-annually. That's why bonds are also often called fixed income investments. But when the bond reaches its maturity date, which in other words is the date of expiration, the company will then repay the investors the initial sum of money, and this is called the face value. So here is a slide that shows a more specific example. Imagine that a company, let's say ABC Company, wants to build a new coal plant for $1 million and decides to issue a bond offering to help pay for the plant. The company might decide to sell 100 bonds to investors for $10,000 each. In this case, the face value or the cost of each bond is 10,000. ABC company, the one borrowing the money, is now referred to as the issuer, the bond issuer and they decide an annual interest rate they'll pay back each year, and this is called the coupon, and the time frame within which it will repay the face value, or basically the 10,000. To decide the coupon, the interest for a bond, the issuer considers the current interest rates to make sure it's competitive with similar bonds and appealing to different investors. The issuer may decide to sell three-year bonds or bonds that have a maturity date in three years with a semi-annual coupon of 4%. So what this means is that at the end of the three years, the bond will reach its maturity and the corporation will repay the 10,000 face value to each of the 100 bondholders. So in other words, to each investor who bought a bond. So the investors get their money back plus a little extra they might have earned as interest. 
So with all of this information in mind, corporate bonds are a critical source of finance for, for coal, oil, and gas companies. But compared and when seeing the overall stock market, the bond market has been completely overlooked. And as banks start to limit the amount of money they lend to carbon intensive industries, coal, oil, and gas companies are turning more and more to the bond market as a safe haven. And as a result of this, the fossil fuel industry has used the bonds and has used bonds as a backdoor for raising large sums of money for expansion. Over half of coal, oil, and gas financing comes from bond issuances on the primary market, and all of the 100 biggest emitting companies are dependent on the bond market for their financing. Coal companies raise at least 2.5 more capital through bond issuance than through bank loans. But bonds are also important for oil and gas companies who have used the opportunity of the low interest rates over the last decade to raise large amounts of money of debt at cheap rates. Bonds also make up a significant portion of oil and gas companies' financing. And although bonds can be issued by both government and also by companies, today we're mostly focusing and we're only focusing on bonds issued by companies and specifically those bonds issued by fossil fuel companies to fund their expansion or what we call toxic bonds. So now I will dive a little bit more into the role of the different financial institutions in funding fossil fuel bonds, as well as some of the key players in each category. So over here, we've already touched upon the bond issuer, which is the fossil fuel company. But then we have the investors, which are the bond holders. When an investor purchases a bond from a fossil fuel company, they are lending the fossil fuel company large sums of money to fund the company's activities. The majority of investors or bondholders are either asset owners or asset managers. So asset owners, and within this category, are pension funds and life insurance companies that look for stable, long-term income so they can meet the responsibilities to pay out pensions and insurance policies. And this is very interesting because there, this desire for stability is completely at odds with their investment in fossil fuel bonds. This also means that these investors are using the public's money, the money that we entrust them with, to fund the climate crisis. Asset managers also have a significant holding in fossil fuel bonds. BlackRock and Vanguard are a league ahead and partly reflect their overall dominance in the industry with trillions of assets under management. So these companies hold over 110 billion in bonds from coal, oil, and gas companies. And then right in the middle, we have the banks, the underwriters, the bond underwriters. So to issue a bond, the company needs a deal maker. And this is where the banks come in. Investment banks manage all aspects of the issuance process. Issuing companies pay banks to advise and assist. And this is typically referred to as underwrite the process. Banks enhance the credibility of the bond offer and ensure a higher chance of successfully issuing a bond. So it's kind of if banks were vouching for the quality of those financial products. So underwriting bonds is very appealing for banks because they can actually pocket all of the profits from the transaction without having any financial risk and without any financial risk actually carrying over on their books as it would if they were having a private or providing a private loan. Instead, the risk is passed on to the investors. And for this reason, exactly for this particular reason, a significant portion of bank fossil fuel financing over the last six years came in the form of bond underwriting as opposed to lending. Yet many bank climate policies at the moment apply only to lending, which leaves a massive 2.7 trillion loophole. So why coal, oil, and gas campaigners need to turn their attention to the bond market? Bonds provide a way to influence companies that are hard to connect with through regular shareholder methods. And unlike strategies involving shareholder engagement and campaigns on bank lending, campaigners often overlook the bond market. And this oversight has left fossil fuel companies 
using corporate bonds to quietly raise money for new projects. So to truly be able to halt funding fossil fuel expansion, we need a plan to specifically address the bond market in our campaign. So how can campaigners disrupt corporate bonds? We launched the Toxic Bonds Network in May 2022 to track and to stop the risky debt that supports fossil fuel expansion. Toxic Bonds Network is a global coalition of organizations and social movements that call on financial institutions to deny debt to companies expanding fossil fuels. So this is a great tactic because financial institutions are not used to the public knowing about the bonds they purchase and underwrite and much less holding them accountable for the impact of these toxic bonds. Yet a growing global movement is doing exactly just that. So we aim basically to tell the story of fossil fuel companies that are hiding in the shadows of the bond market to fund their expansion. And therefore, what we're trying to do is drive down investor appetite for investment in new toxic bonds. So now for a more detailed perspective, let's delve into the key developers driving the Mountain Valley Pipeline project. So in this slide, we have Next Era Energy, Alta Gas, Con Edison, RGC Resources, Equitrans, and they are the ones that are currently developing the Mountain Valley Pipeline project. And while we currently lack the specific data on the outstanding bonds related to the Mountain Valley Pipeline project for each of these companies, it's important to note that every single one of these companies involved in this project have outstanding bonds. And this involves a collaboration of various investors and banks. But for those with a keen interest, we can further conduct a thorough analysis of the diverse range of stakeholders in these deals. However, we will take a closer look now into one specific investor, namely Vanguard, which becomes very crucial given our focus today on asset managers. So Vanguard holds over $54 billion in bonds issued by coal, oil, and gas expansionists, $19 billion in coal, and $35 billion in oil and gas. Vanguard holds $2.9 billion in bonds issued by MVP developers. So these are just some of the specific data to give you an idea of its fossil fuel bond holdings. So once more, the, ma the main demand of denying debt or investors not buying new bonds and banks not underwriting them will hit companies hardest by forcing them to find other investors for their bonds, likely raising the cost of debt. Ultimately, if we're successful, it will stop bonds as a safe and easy route for fossil fuel developers to raise money. So I want to thank you all for your attention and please do reach out if you want to have a conversation and expand your knowledge about toxic bonds or if there are any campaign resources that you would like to see. We would be happy to connect with you all and I hope this has been a useful session in terms of understanding a little bit more, more about how we can use the bonds market and use it in our campaigns for the future. Thank you so much and I hope you all have a nice day. Okay, so now that we've learned about bonds from Jimena, I want to share with you a short description of what exactly is the Vanguard SOS campaign. Uh, Vanguard SOS is a global campaign pushing Vanguard to chart a new course away from climate catastrophe and towards truly sustainable and responsible investing. Vanguard CEO, Tim Buckley and his crew are missing the iceberg ahead and all of our lives depend on them turning their ship around. We're campaigning network of civil society organizations, social movements, and financial experts working together to secure a climate safe future for everyone. Individuals, shareholders, investors, NGOs, and employees are all joining the call for Vanguard to stop funding climate chaos and escalating economic risk. 
I now want to pass it over to Lena, our colleague and campaign partner from Equate, to share with us some of the incredible work that Equate has done. Thank you so much, Ziamara. And I'm just going to take a moment to take a breath myself. I am just so honored with the expertise in this room, the knowledge in this room, and um, want to celebrate the fact that it is by design that these asset managers and investors have created a complicated system to hide the impacts of what they're doing. But the impacts destroy people's lives, have been and will, unless we push them to take action. So I'm just going to take a moment to breathe, absorb some of the brilliance and complexity that Humana just shared uh, before I share a little more about our work with Equate. The Earthquaker Action Team, or Equate, is my spiritual home, as, where, as well as the place where I was sort of politicized over a decade ago. Um, as a young person, um, curious about structural inequality, curious about taking action uh, for a livable planet and holding corporations accountable. Uh, Equate was founded by Quakers in southeastern Pennsylvania and has run three different campaigns focusing on various corporate targets um, and using uh, the historical strength of civil disobedience, spiritually grounded civil disobedience to guide our work. And uh, in now about two, three years ago, um, we were invited to consider um, looking in our own backyard to Vanguard. Vanguard's international headquarters is in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Um, they employ a lot of people in southeastern Pennsylvania, and a lot of Quakers and others in our area have retirement funds, personal funds in Vanguard. And so uh, we felt led uh, at the time that uh, we were invited to take up this work uh, and call on this institution that we have access to uh, that happens to be the largest investor internationally in fossil fuels to do much better than it has been. We launched our efforts uh, really publicly on, on the scene uh, in April of 2022. You can see a picture here of this 40 mile march that ended at Vanguard headquarters. Uh, you can see the inflatable Tim Buckley in the background. But uh, what's really important is that the march started in Chester, Pennsylvania. Uh, where residents have been fighting for decades against polluting industries, including an incinerator, many of which are Vanguard investments um, right here in our area. So as Vanguard profits from climate destruction around the globe, uh, as it profits from climate destruction and human rights uh, infractions along the Mountain Valley Pipeline, it does so in our backyard here in southeastern Pennsylvania as well. And so we launched this effort really connecting the dots from impact in Chester to this bucolic, kind of beautiful, almost college campus in Malvern, Pennsylvania, where their corporate offices are. So this picture you see is, is uh, the end of that march, folks coming together, um, trying to make clear this connection. Uh, next slide, please, Viamara. And through our connection with the Sunrise Project and Amazon Watch, it's been really critical that we continue to lift up the impacts of Vanguard's investments. Again, because by design, they're really insulated from that impact. Those of us here in southeastern Pennsylvania, um, myself as a young white woman, have been taught and encouraged not to look at the impacts 
that uh, my privilege might come uh, on on uh, on the back step. And so, um, in November of 2022, uh, we were able to uh, welcome uh, an indigenous delegation from Peru that was fighting the expansion of Petro Peru, funded largely through bonds. Um, that was destroying uh, traditional fishing uh, areas on the coast, as well as some of their uh, traditional lands in the Amazon. And Vanguard was one of the largest purchasers of those Petro Peru bonds. Next slide, please. This is a picture from um, an action we felt led to take last spring. Um, Vanguard has not been silent or stoic through this process. Uh, it is actively making decisions every day. And we launched this big public campaign, um, an international launch of the campaign all took place, as I mentioned, in spring of 2022. In December of 2022, Vanguard left uh, the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. It was one of their only climate commitments, um, and they publicly left it and defended the choice of leaving uh, this climate commitment. Um, that led us to feel clear within Equate that it was time for us to show the depth of our commitment as well to this work um, and to take some greater risks. So in April of 2023, um, we took action at every entrance of Vanguard's headquarters in Malvern, Pennsylvania. Uh, folks uh, sat in uh, Quaker worship. Um, folks uh, felt led to uh, refuse to move. And over 16 people were arrested, which is the image that you see here. Move to continue to take action. We launched then later in the spring of 2023 uh, a pledge for folks to start moving their money away from Vanguard. Diamara, if you could move to the next slide. So a question that we often get is, you know, why is Vanguard not offering more climate safe funds or don't they have some funds that are available? And um, as of 2023, less than half of a percent of their total assets under management were in so-called um, environmental uh, uh, socially responsible funds or ESG funds. Now, I'm not going to get into a big debate about this, but I will name some resources that I encourage folks to check out. Uh, there's a tool with um, an organization called As You Sow that you can put in all of the funds that uh, Vanguard claims are uh, socially responsible funds. You can type them into this tool and see how they actually stack up. Um, and then Quakers uh, also care about investments in militarism, prisons, militarized borders. Um, and another tool you can check is this tool from our friends at the American Friends Service Committee. And um, of all of the funds, again, less than half of a percent that Vanguard uh, promotes as socially responsible funds, not one of them matches the criteria in both of these tools. Um, so there are some funds that do slightly better on the environment, uh, but then they don't uh, pass the filters of, of uh, not being uh, invested in militarism or private prisons. Um, and then if they're you know, better on some of those, they're heavily invested in fossil fuels. So I encourage folks, you can look up the name of any funds that you may have investments into these tools and see how they actually stack up. The As You Sow tool is also helpful because it will show you the many ways that asset managers and different funds like these are exposed to fossil fuel. So it's not, as Humana was saying, it's not just through direct loans and banks. It's also through insurance companies. It may also be through bonds. Um, so I definitely encourage folks to check out those tools. And to the question of why is Vanguard doing this? Why are they not offering more um, options to investors that want these, these options? I think uh, perhaps a cynical view is they've yet to be convinced that it is worth it to them. 
And it's part of our job as social movements to provide the collective pressure to make it clear that they must act, that enough people uh, will move their money away if they do not act, that they must take uh, real action and provide real mainstream products that provide for a livable planet and human rights. So um, we, as I mentioned, we launched this effort last spring uh, to encourage folks to have their monies in fossil fuel, uh, in Vanguard, excuse me, folks who have their monies in Vanguard can start moving their money out as a part of a collective effort and a collective action to stand clear and say, we will not stand for these impacts of our investments. So um, the picture in this slide, we had two events in June of 2023, one again in Chester, connecting the dots to the impacts of Vanguard's uh, investments locally, um, and then one at their headquarters launching this pledge. There are three parts of the Never Vanguard pledge. Uh, if you invest in Vanguard, you can pledge to move your money out. Uh, you can pledge uh, not to invest in Vanguard if you aren't currently. And if you're a young person, you can pledge not to work for Vanguard until they take meaningful action on climate. Um, so that's just a little bit more about um, why at that stage in the campaign, we decided to launch this pledge. And uh, we launched the pledge in June of 2023, as I mentioned, and have now had um, hundreds of people signed the pledge. The last time I checked, it was over 450 people signed the pledge, and over $25 million have been moved away from Vanguard. Now, that's a drop in the bucket of their trillions under management, but it's about collective pressure, and it's about a reput reputational risk. So again, what motivates these asset managers? Their reputation is very important to them. Part of what generates their business is that they're seen as responsible stewards. And so our job as social movements is to make clear with our actions that they're not responsible stewards, to dramatize the story and to create a tip of the iceberg effect where it's not just us moving our money, but it's the risk of other people of conscience falling in, in line that, that pushes them to action. And you can sign that pledge. You, uh, Roberta just put uh, that link into the chat if you're interested in joining that effort. And um, I'm just checking to see if there's other questions here that I might be able to answer. And I'm not sure, Roberta, where to see the question box for Ali's question. Maybe you can send it to me. But I'll take a breath and just say that um, something I've learned in this campaign is that, thank goodness, the future is not bound by the limits of my own imagination. Uh, these systems are very big. Uh, but I've just seen time and time again the power that people have when we come together and create things and actually take action for what we believe. Um, so it's um, really critical, I think, and it's a part of my faith to take action on my values, and then so much more feels possible once I step toward that action. I get out of the paralysis and uh, the despair that I can feel when I look at the depths of these issues. Um, I do encourage folks, I'm seeing some questions here about, oh, where do I move my money instead? Now, Equate is not a fiduciary and we do not offer investment advice. However, we do have a number of resources on the Never Vanguard page on our website, uh, including the As You So tool, including uh, some uh, resources uh, for webinars uh, coming up. Um, we do regular moving money webinars uh, where folks can come together and explore together uh, what their values are and what options there are to follow their values with their investments. Um, I will say uh, for those who are concerned about retirement funds, because uh, there can be costs associated with moving retirement funds. Um, lots of people, you know, have, we've now moved 25 million. If you have a question, I can almost guarantee that someone has grappled with that question since we launched the pledge in June. And so we'd love to connect you with folks uh, who can answer some of that. We have uh, customers have been building a resource document that we share with everyone who attends a webinar. So that includes some of their own recommendations of uh, people they like, 
Um, there's also a list um, on As You Sow and on our website um, for many of the different uh, more climate friendly funds that are out there. So uh, we can definitely point you to resources. Um, so if you go actually to the Never Vanguard page on our website, at the bottom is a frequently asked questions. And you'll see the second question is where do, you know, where do I move my money instead? Very common question. And there's a bunch of resources there. So do encourage folks to check that out for sure. Um, I'm seeing another question about folks getting involved in shareholder resolutions at Vanguard. Thank you so much for asking this. Um, part of the reason that we are focusing our attention on Vanguard and asking folks to move their money now is also because they're one of the worst on uh, shareholder resolutions and proxy voting. They've routinely been the worst uh, in supporting climate and social uh, resolutions. Uh, in 2022, they supported 12% of climate and social shareholder resolutions. And in 2023, that went down to just 2%. So, um, I feel convinced that they are sliding backwards at a time when it's critical that they, we need to provide uh, pressure uh, for them to change course. So um, there are groups that are still, you know, putting forward uh, shareholder resolutions and proxy votes that we would support. Um, but if you also feel convinced that Vanguard is going backward and feel ready to take action, either as someone with funds in Vanguard ready to move your money, or um, as someone who uh, would, would sign the pledge in a different capacity, you can, you can do that. And I would encourage you to consider it. Um, that being said, there are lots of groups out there, including our friends at Sierra Club and otherwise, who do shareholder resolutions, encourage folks to, to support them. And we would love for Vanguard to use their substantial power to push the companies that they're invested in to do better. They just have shown us time and again that they aren't doing that. And I feel like I've gone on and on, um, but thank you all for listening and for having us here I mean, I like to let you go on and on because it's all very interesting and I love the way that you share with us. Thank you so much, Lena. I appreciate you. Um, I know that Roberta had an addition also to add, so I'm going to pass it over to Roberta. Um, I just wanted to add a little, um, I guess, a piece of information about Vanguard, which is really really upsetting when you think about it. Um, and I think it's yet another reason why we really need to um, exercise pressure against this company. So um, interestingly enough, Vanguard is not a publicly traded company. So it really means that um, it doesn't really have traditional shareholders. And so it is not possible to file a resolution at Vanguard as a company and demand the company, demand its board of directors, demand uh, its executives to take action on climate. Um, and so really that leaves you with really the public facing, the grassroots pressure um, as the key leverage, the key strategy to really bring this company honestly to its knees and really put it in a position where they have to think about climate. And so I bring this up because resolutions can be you know, the resolutions that um, our friends at Sierra Club file at fossil fuel companies or any other companies that really need to think about a credible transition plans. But you can also fight resolutions at BlackRock, for example, the other asset manager, to really uh, look at um, its, its climate actions. And so unfortunately, we don't get to do that with Vanguard because it is not a publicly traded company. And so we really, really have to rely on the grassroots pressure for this company. So I, I think I think um, I feel like that's an important piece for folks to know that makes Vanguard also a very obscure company, not transparent and really just accountable to who we don't know. So we have to ultimately um, really turn it um, to make it accountable to to us, the people. Um, so, yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. OK, so the question is, what's next? Um, on March 11th, 2024, the plan is that we will be launching a Vanguard Mountain Valley Pipeline campaign. 
It will be a webinar. The opening will be a webinar featuring speak speakers who have been resisting the Mountain Valley Pipeline for over a decade, as well as a summary of what folks can look forward to in the next few months as ways to participate in the campaign and learn more for those of you who may be new to the Mountain Valley Pipeline fight. So whereas this webinar was really geared towards, let's make sure we can have all a base understanding of what is an asset manager. The, the campaign launch is, okay, now that we have that information with us, what is the Mountain Valley Pipeline? And what are we gonna do to combine those two enormous buckets of knowledge to try and make some change, trying to apply pressure um, and hopefully bring in folks who maybe don't know or haven't been involved in climate finance anything, but really care about Mountain Valley Pipeline or our local community who are impacted by Mountain Valley Pipeline and are like, I wanna get involved, how can I get involved? Or people who have been working in the climate finance resistance work and haven't plugged into Mountain Valley yet and they really want to be a part of that. Um, so I want to invite you to register, here's the link, to the webinar that we will be doing on March 11th. Um, when you click that link, there's like no information yet. We haven't filled it in yet, but that's the date. And it's so that you don't forget. Um, when you registered for this webinar, it should have given you an option to receive updates um, from the different participants and the like from Power, from Equate. We also put seven directions of service um, and Vanguard SOS. And we'll be sharing the contact information with the different groups um, according to how you registered. So uh, if you signed up somewhere to get updates, you'll get updates. But in case you're one of those people who never checks your email, here is the link for you um, so that you can go ahead and register. Um, I want to see if there are, I know we've done a pretty great job of um, answering questions and this Q&A box is incorrect. Jimena and Camila are not actually here. <laughs> so it's down to Roberta and Lena and myself. And I also want to like really give a big thank you to Roberta who is part of our Vanguard SOS team who's been fielding questions and working the chat and making magic happen over there. So uh, really say, super thankful for you, Roberta. Um, are there any other questions that maybe we haven't gotten to yet? Cool. It doesn't sound like there's burning questions. If you wake up in the middle of the night with a burning question, we are going to be sending out an email with a recording of this webinar and contact information for ways that you can reach out to people and get answers to your questions. Um, I really appreciate all of you who have joined us this evening. Uh, we really hope that this has been helpful in laying the foundation for understanding why asset managers play a huge part in the climate finance ecosystem and how pressuring them can have such power in site-specific resistance to impact local communities and the road to a cleaner future. Uh, I'm really thankful to Power and Equate and Denali and Lena for being here. I know it's super early for Denali, um, and so, so grateful um, and for helping to make this webinar happen, all the amazing work that you guys are doing. And I hope that everyone has a wonderful evening and we'll see you. If we don't see you before March 11th, we will see you on March 11th. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks everyone.